Well, I want to open us up with prayer. I know we've already prayed, but I want to ask God to speak to you today in a powerful way through his word. So let's do that right now. God, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for truth. God, we thank you that your word is transformative. And God, I just pray that you would help us today to just sense your spirit speaking to us. I pray that your word would come alive. God, I pray that it would seem uh, so very clear and that we would practically see your truth in a way that we could begin to walk it out more and more in our life. So we just say, will you do your work right now through your word in your precious and holy name? And everyone said, amen, amen. So over the last few weeks, I've been challenging you to consider the commitments that you're going to make in the coming year. Challenge you to consider what you're going to commit to in 2024. And if you were here for um, New Year's Eve, we talked about the commitment to give thanks. Like, be, be like the one leper out of the 10 that Jesus healed that came back and gave thanks. I guarantee you all 10 were grateful. All 10 have an attitude of thankfulness. So like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad I'm healed. But one came back and gave thanks. And so the challenge of what does it mean for you and I to walk this out of giving thanks to the Lord for all that he has done for us. And then we, uh, we dove into other commitments. And, and over the past several weeks, I, I just want to encourage you, um, if you haven't been here, um, go to our YouTube channel and check out some of the sermons uh, because really we're, we're challenging people to, to commit to following God and really understand his way. That means we need to get his word in, in us. We, a couple weeks ago, we, we looked at the commitment to surrender. What does it mean for us to really surrender, to sacrifice? And, and we began to walk that out. We did a 10-day Daniel fast together. And then last week, we, we looked at this idea of this commitment to daily conversations with God. You and I know this as prayer. But I'm being intentional about the language here because I really want us to get in, into our DNA the, the idea that I have the opportunity and actually I, have the, I should have the obligation, I should have the urgency, I should have the motivation to have a daily conversation with God. He invites us to do that. And we looked at the, 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 some of the, the mistakes that we easily make last week. We looked at some of the mistakes of not understanding what hallowed be your name means and not understanding maybe um, the, the, the magnitude of the holiness of God and, and that we could just kind of almost be too casual about it. But then on the other end of the extreme, we, we saw how Hebrews warns us to, to, to not shy away from coming into the presence of God, not shy away from this conversation, but we come with confidence. It's not with cockiness. It's not with arrogance. It's not flippantly. We see his holiness. We understand that. But we also know that because of the cross, we've been made holy and we are told to, with confidence, come into his presence and have this conversation. And finally, last week, we looked at the importance and the biblical truth as, as, as we see all throughout scripture, this idea that it is a conversation. It's not a speech. Because see, in a conversation, there's, there's two people who are communicating. It's not just a speech where information is going out, but really it's a dialogue. And we looked at, we should go into this daily conversation with God, expecting for God to prompt us, to lead us, to direct us, to speak to us. We should expect that. We should expect that. And so we kind of looked at that. We just kind of scratched the surface last week of what it means for us to, to, to dive into a daily conversation with God and do it in the right way, with the right approach. Now today, I want to continue on that. And we're going to look in Matthew 6. And, and we probably don't even need to look in your bulletin. You could probably, most of you recite this. But it says this in Matthew 6, verse 9, Jesus himself says, pray then like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That means 
His name is so holy. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to ask you, let's say that out loud. Let's read that out loud, okay? Say, say, let's say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we could probably all recite that, like I said. But I don't want us to rush past that. That's not just like an opening line into the prayer that gets us to where we really need to get. And that's like, uh, God, can you take care of my needs? It's absolutely biblical that God will provide for you. And he instructs us to pray and to present our requests to him. That's, that's not it. But what I, what I want us to see, we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about God providing for our needs and the importance of this dialogue called prayer when it comes to that. But before we get to that, let's not rush past this line, your kingdom come, your will be done. You see, this is actually probably way more profound and life-changing than sometimes we perhaps would think. This is actually one of the most epic things that you can cry out to God, your kingdom come. You see, and what we have here is perhaps a need to just really unpack what does that mean. So if we're instructed, if Jesus says, come to me daily and pray like this, and he said this, this in Matthew 6, we talked about this in Matthew 6, this was in a large setting. This was in the Sermon on the Mount. One of the most famous passages of scripture where Jesus downloads the Beatitudes. Um, he just downloads the Lord's Prayer. It's a powerful, power, powerful section of pass, passage of scripture. And then also in Luke 11, the same response is given when an individual, one of Jesus's followers, was seeing Jesus pray, and he goes to him and he says, Lord, teach us to pray. In both settings, in this major gathering and in this smaller intimate setting, Jesus says, here's how I want you to pray, and it starts out with, hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come. So what does it mean, really, to pray that line. That's what I want us to see today. What does it mean to pray, thy kingdom come? Well, I want us to see three things about that. Number one, when you're praying, thy kingdom come, you, you should be praying that you yourself are entering into the kingdom of God in that moment, in that day, in that setting. You, you should be praying, when you're saying, thy kingdom come, you're not saying, God, I, I hope that your kingdom comes just somewhere, somehow, you know, you make it happen. No, 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 this is actually part of the interaction that you are having with God, and, and you're saying, thy kingdom come, and what you're, you're praying is, make your kingdom become a reality in my life. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we should be in the midst of this powerful line. We should see just that. We should see the power of the kingdom of God. Because when we're praying for thy kingdom come, it's like, do we recognize the power of that kingdom? Do we really recognize what we're, what we're asking God to do? We sang a song uh, in worship as the last one. It was um, 100 billion or no, so will I is the name of the song. And basically it's talking about, look, if creation is going to bow down before you, what is that saying? You have all authority. You have all power. You are over everything. If, if that's it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recognize that. I'm, so will I. I'm going to bow down before you. I'm going to worship. I'm going to do that. That's recognizing the power of his kingdom. And finally, when you're praying, thy kingdom come, I, I want you to know that there's actually, you are praying that you can participate in the building of his kingdom. 
I know that's a lot in that line, but I want you to see, again, when you're praying, thy kingdom come, the first thing is that you are, that you are entering the kingdom, that you're recognizing the power of the kingdom, and that you yourself are building the kingdom. That's what that means, thy kingdom come. So let's look at that. Let's first off recognize the, the kingdom itself, and let's get a better understanding of what the kingdom is, because I know that you and I, we are faced with, all throughout the week, news articles and developments that are taking place in kingdoms all over this planet. Big kingdoms, little kingdoms, government kingdoms, social kingdoms, cultural kingdoms. There's a lot of kingdoms out there. There's a lot of conflict in the kingdoms as well. And, and so when we approach this idea of what is the kingdom of God, I want us to, you know, just get out of our mind what our idea of an earthly kingdom is. Because honestly, that is no help in understanding what the spiritual kingdom is, what the kingdom of heaven, what God's kingdom is. is. And I want us to start by going back to Daniel. And this is something that we looked at. We were, we were in the, the book of Daniel a couple weeks ago when we were being challenged to do the Daniel fast. And Daniel is a very prophetic book. Do you remember when we got to Daniel chapter 10 and Daniel decided that he was going to fast for three weeks and, and he, de he decided not to you know, eat meat or drink wine or have any you know, sugar and that's kind of what we used as our guide to do the Daniel fast as a church and, and, he, and he did that but in the midst of that do you remember he had an encounter from an angel and an angel freaked him out as we all would be, the angel freaked him out, but the angel said, don't be afraid. I have come, and I'm going to tell you what is to come. Daniel was a prophet. Daniel heard from the Lord. He became the, the, the mouthpiece of the Lord to his generation. And he prophetically spoke about what was to come in his world, in the world that he was living in, in the age that he was at, God had some prophetic words to the children of Israel in that time, but he also downloaded to Daniel some stuff about the eternal, not just the present. This is one of those prophetics. This is God speaking through the prophet Daniel. And he says this in 7 verse 27, and the kingdom... And the dominion, that means the authority, that means the, the reign. And the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting king, kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is really, really powerful. I want us to think about this for a second because when you are praying thy kingdom come, you, there's, a, there's an aspect of it that is in the future. It's the everlasting kingdom. It's the new heaven and the new earth. It's this right here. It's the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven. It doesn't matter if it's China or the US or Russia or Iran or whoever. It doesn't matter. All kingdoms on this planet after the second coming, when God comes back and he sets up his his new reign. There is no kingdom that doesn't come under his kingdom. He has all authority. It's all in his kingdom. All of it. It's under his, his authority and his dominion. And get this, this is powerful. And this is part of your prayer. And sometimes we, we get so caught up in the here and now that we forget about the unbelievable future that we have. Because look at this, it says, and all of that, that reign, all of that authority and that, 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 that kingdom, you get to be a part of that. It says, that shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Guess what? You are a saint of the Most High. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, His righteousness becomes your righteousness, and, and you are now a saint. You may not act like it all the time, but God looks at the righteousness of Jesus when He looks at you. 
You are a saint. When we are praying, are we forgetting the incredible inheritance that we have? Romans 8 puts it this way. You have been adopted as God's own children. And if you're in his family, you're actually co-heirs with Christ. You're co-heirs. You receive the inheritance that Christ has. And what we have is a Christ who is over everything. Jesus is over everything. This is the kingdom of God. So when we're praying for your kingdom come, there's a, there's a future component that we're praying. We're like, God, come back. Now, I know that sometimes we, we don't think like that. But you are going to reign with Christ in an everlasting kingdom that has complete, total, godly authority. That's the word of God. So when we pray thy kingdom come, there's a future component. But here's, here's a mistake that we can easily make. It's almost like this pie in the sky thing. And we don't mean it to be like that. We certainly don't. That's not our heart. But, you know, like thy kingdom come. It's like, okay, someday we're not going to have presidential elections anymore. Praise God. Someday I'm not going to be dealing with this or this or this. Someday I'm going to have a new body. Praise God. And, 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 and we, while the future is, in fact, a very awesome reality, and we should be mindful of that, we also have a present reality of the kingdom of God. It's not just the future. So it shouldn't be like, thy kingdom come someday. Whenever you want to, God, I know you're going to come back someday. When I pray, thy kingdom come, there's also a right here, right now reality. So what does that look like? It's, kinda, it's easier for me to understand like all the kingdoms in the world are going to submit to God one day. That conceptually, I can understand probably easier sometimes than this idea of the kingdom of God is something that I need to enter into right now. What does it look like right now? Well, the right now component is not physical, though God is in control of the earth, but I, I want you to see this is an internal decision that you make. This is why this is extremely intimate. This is why it's, it's extremely personal. And this is why in your conversation, your daily conversation with God, you should be saying, God, I want to enter into your kingdom today. How does that take place? It takes place in the invisible realm of your heart. We see in Luke 17, 20, Jesus said, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them saying, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. What's that tell you? That tells you that the kingdom of God, it, it may not be visible to the world, but it is no, nonetheless extremely, very much real. How do I enter into it? I can't see it. How do I enter into it? We enter into it by establishing God's kingdom, submitting to his kingdom in our heart. In our heart, we see this um, in, in Samuel 16, 7. There's a great illustration in the Old Testament. It, this is, this is um, an example of King Saul. He was the first king of ancient Israel, okay? He's the first king of ancient Israel, and he had it all together. He was good looking. He was tall. He was, he was well built. He was smart. He came from the right family. He, he just had it all going on. He knew he was charismatic in, in, a, in, in some aspects. He was a little bit shy, but he knew how to lead people. Problem is, he didn't know how to lead himself. And he didn't know how to submit to God. This is a, a conversation that Samuel is unpacking. And it says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his, this is Saul, his appearance or the height of his stature, stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You see, from the get-go, here's a guy who had a kingdom had a physical kingdom that you could observe. He had it all going on. 
But the reality is the real kingdom, the kingdom that really matters is the kingdom of God. And that, that is something that takes place through us being yielded in our heart. And, and God's looking at the heart saying, not happening. Not happening. Compares to um, David, though, in Acts 13, verse 21, it says this. It's talking about the same situation. Then they, that would be ancient Israel, ask for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he, that's God, removed him, Saul, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, get this, who will do all my will. What we're seeing here is the difference between a kingdom that you can observe and a kingdom, a godly kingdom, that is established in a person's heart. Saul had the exterior kingdom, but wasn't yielded on the interior kingdom. David, on the other hand, was following the pattern, actually, that Jesus preached and Jesus taught us to pray because he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And when we look at David, God says, he's a guy who's after my own heart. His heart is right, and he does my will. And so that's the very first thing that you and I can do. We can have a little bit of a a gut check and an evaluation, and you don't beat yourself up, but you ask yourself honestly, when I pray, your kingdom come, am I really wanting that in my heart? Am I really willing to enter into that kingdom? And by the way, that kingdom, again, is in the future, the everlasting eternal kingdom that we as saints get to reign with God. But there is a right here, right now component. We know that from Jesus himself. We're going to look at the scripture. He says, um, the kingdom of God is at hand. It means it's right here, right here, right now. And Jesus instructed that that we enter into the kingdom. So there is this, this prayer that you and I have when we say thy kingdom come and that is help me enter your kingdom have your kingdom and the reality of that come into my life let's look at how we do this we do it through yielding to Jesus Christ in the in the uh, in the Acts passage when it gets done saying it's talking about David he's a man after his own heart who does my will it goes on and says a little bit about Jesus it's a little bit of a foreshadowing of what this looks like it says of this man's offspring that's David God brought to Israel a savior Jesus as he promised now listen to this before Jesus the savior came John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. In fact, Jesus um, is is entering into his ministry. He's about to get baptized, and we get to, to peek at what John is doing. And in Matthew 3, it says this, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that's something that we need to get a a, a grasp of right there. That there is is a future kingdom and there is a right now at hand kingdom that we are called to enter into. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have to yield. And right here it says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So if I'm praying, God, your kingdom come in my life, that's a good place for you and I to start is to repent in areas of our life that are not yielded to his authority, his lordship, his power, his reign. Matthew 7, 21, this is Jesus himself saying, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. John 3, 3, Jesus answered, somebody who was asking him when the kingdom was going to come. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We're seeing this, this, this important concept that you and I, to enter the kingdom, we need to enter with a, a posture of repentance. We need to um, not just talk the talk, 
Because Jesus says, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, actually enter the kingdom. It's those that do his will. It's, it's this idea of, when I pray, God, your kingdom come, that's a recognizing of his authority and his lordship. And, and just, that's just saying, you know what? I'm going to yield to you even when it hurts. Not my will, Lord, but your will. It's this idea of aligning with God. And Jesus himself says, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord. That's, you know, one way is not everyone who professes to be a Christian. Not everyone who says, yeah, I go to church. Not everyone who says, I'm a Christian. Not everyone who even has a bumper sticker on their car will enter the kingdom of heaven. Because it's really not about what's on the outside, it's on the inside. And are we yielded? Because here's the deal. In a kingdom, there's a king. There's only one king. There's not two kings. You know, I don't enter into a co-leadership position with God and we negotiate what I'm going to do and what I'm not. Either I'm yielded to his lordship, I recognize his kingdom, or I'm not. And, and so what Jesus even says, he goes on to say um, that you, you can't, if you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. That's saying if, if you haven't said, Jesus, the old is dead because of you, that I'm a new person. I'm a new creature. Romans says, the person that confesses with their mouth that he is Lord. That's like saying, you're the boss of me. You see, we can run past these words pretty quickly in our prayer, and it should never become rote or just just automatic. Your kingdom come. No, what that means is your lordship come. Will it come? Not only is it coming in the future eternally, praise God for that, but can it come right now? And how does that happen? Well, I repent. I'm born again. I've, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord. I'm yielded to him. Jesus goes on and says this in Luke 18, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. What does that mean? Entering like a child. Well, a kid usually doesn't call all the shots. Hopefully not. There are those moments, right? (laughs) If you've been a parent, you're like, okay. But what it means to to come like a child, to enter in the kingdom like a child, that means I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be like, I might not be the smartest guy in the room right now. God, will you guide? Will you direct? I, I know your wisdom is way better than my wisdom. I know your way is way better than mine. I know your will is way better than my will. I'm going to humbly come right now. I'm, I'm going to come with open arms and, and, you know, like a child, I'm going to let you lead me. That's what it means. Jesus is saying, if you don't receive the kingdom of God like a child, you're not going to enter it. So, so he's, he's really, really talking about the reality of his kingdom right now. It's in the heart. It's an attitude of my heart. And Jesus goes on to say in six, uh, Matthew 6, 33, which is later in the chapter after the Lord's Prayer, when it starts talking about the needs that we have and presenting the needs before God, and that's biblical. But he says what you need to do first, seek his kingdom. So when we pray the Lord's Prayer, and we say, thy kingdom come, I want you to know, here's really what it looks like. Thy kingdom come. Like, both of us can't be in charge right now. Because that's not what a kingdom is. That's not what your kingdom is. Jesus said, Enter the kingdom. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we need to not only enter the kingdom, but we need to recognize what it is. You don't enter the kingdom just so you can get squashed. 
You enter the kingdom of God humbly, like a child, with repentance, willing to do his will, knowing that God looks on the heart, not on the outside. And it's an intimate thing between you and God, and you enter like that. But you don't just sit there and, and just be like, woe is me, you, you, you know, just strike me dead, God. No, it's entering into the reality of when I come into his presence and I pray his kingdom come, it's also praying for the reality of his power to be manifested in my life and in the life of the people around me that I'm praying for and in my world. I know I'm like being repetitive this morning, but I, I just really sense that we, we have to grasp the, the reality of what this is. Thy kingdom come. It's such a powerful, powerful phrase. Do we know do we know what we're asking for? Jesus says this in 28, 18. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority. So here's, here's the thing, and it's kind of like that worship song that we sang. Here's the thing. The kingdom exists whether we recognize it or not. His authority, his lordship exists whether you recognize it or not. It's there. But when you're saying, thy kingdom come, it's like, God, help me to understand the reality of that, the reality of your lordship, the reality of your authority, the, the reality of your power. Psalm 103, 19 puts it this way. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. All authority. His kingdom rules over all. 1 Corinthians 4 puts it this way, for the kingdom of God does not consist of talk, but of power. You see, when we are asking for God's kingdom to come, it's, it's us recognizing the lordship, the authority, um, the rule, the reign. It's already there, whether I recognize it or not, but it's aligning my thinking with, oh, wow, I'm serving, you know, the, you, you've heard people kind of like, you know, when they don't want to say the God word or especially Jesus, they say higher power. Okay, well, that's just, you know, like whatever, cultural group think. But, but the reality is there's truth in that phrase, higher power. It is God, it is Jesus. But, but do we recognize his unbelievable power? Because when we do... When we recognize that, things start to change in our life. So, so not only does, does I, do I enter, I strive to enter the kingdom of God, I want to come in the right way. Just like last week, we talked about how do we come into this conversation with God and we honor his name, we recognize that he is holy, we want to make sure that we, the posture of our heart is, is right. In the same way, when it comes to thy kingdom come, we need to recognize the power of God. We need to recognize his authority. And actually, can I just say this? There's a place for you to be bold and declare the authority and power of God in your world and in your life. It's okay to pray like this. God, your kingdom come. God, I, I pray that your authority and your lordship and your power manifest itself right now in this area in my life. God, I know you are Lord. You are on the throne. And I'm asking right now that you help me with this situation. Everything is under your feet. God, I need a breakthrough. I need a breakthrough in my personal life. I need a breakthrough in my family. God, will you move? You are in control. I'm coming to the God of the universe. All authority is, is yours. And, and, and I'm not coming to somebody who, who might sort of maybe possibly on a good day be able to help me you can help me right now God and I'm asking for that I'm asking for a manifestation of your power and your authority and by the way I promise I'm going to recognize that myself and I'm going to submit to that and I'm not going to just ask for your authority without yielding to it as well I'm not going to ask for your power without recognizing that I am powerless, but you are all powerful, and I stake my hope and my future and my situation in your hands because you're a good God. Thy kingdom come in this situation, in my life right now, God. 
coming. I'm coming humbly. I'm coming like a child. I'm, I'm repenting. And by the way, what this, that whole idea of repentance, you know what? That's not just once you, when you first got saved. That's on a daily basis. That's when, I, when I'm recognizing the authority of God, when I'm recognizing his kingdom, I'm recognizing his lordship, and I'm also recognizing that there are things in my life that aren't lining up with that. And, and so, you know what, God, th- this area over here, you know what, it's not lining up with, with your kingdom, and, and so I repent. I repent, and I'm coming humbly, and, and, and I'm asking you to help me with that, but I'm crying out to a God who's all-powerful. In Luke, Jesus describes this power a little bit. In Luke 11, we have the second version of the the Lord's Prayer. And and what's interesting is right after that, right after that, Jesus does something that demonstrates his power. Jesus did all sorts of miracles. There's this one miracle that took place that started a debate, though, about where his power came from. And it's this miracle right here. Jesus delivered somebody who was demonized. Jesus kicked the demon out. We won't take time to read the whole story, but here's what happened. Jesus delivered somebody, and the critics around were like, you know what, nice trick. But um, he delivered the demon uh, by using the powers of Satan. Jesus uh, said no. Here's how Jesus responded. Luke eleven seventeen. 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's probably because you've heard the phrase, the house divided against itself cannot stand, right? So Google that, and and you know who said that? Abraham Lincoln. Guess what? He was borrowing the words from Jesus. Jesus is like, that's idiotic. Satan is not going to drive out one of his demons because Satan and his demons are working together and that would be like a house divided against itself. He's like, That's the, I'm, I did not use the powers of Satan to, to drive out this demon. But it goes on to say in verse 20, but it's by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is a very important principle. He says this, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one is stronger, circle that word if you're an underliner or a circler, but when one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away his armor, which he trusted and divides his spoil. Jesus is talking about the power of the kingdom of God and in the manifestation of power where a person is delivered from a demon, there's, a, there's an argument about where the power comes from and Jesus says, make no mistake about it, the power is coming from the kingdom of God because if you're, ex- if you're seeing this power, it's because the kingdom of God is here. And by the way, then he goes on to say, you know what, if one strong man is overtaken by another strong man, what's he saying there? He's saying that God is the ultimate strong man. There's no demon. There's no enemy. The devil himself is not more powerful than God. When we pray, thy kingdom come, I want us to see that we're inviting the power of of the living God to come into our situation, to come into our family, to come into my, my thought life, to come into my world, to come into the world, which is chaotic right now. Would all the power of the kingdom begin to manifest itself just like a demon being rebuked out of a person. Can we see that kind of power? Can I just encourage you? We should be praying for that kind of demonstration, not because we're like looking for like, you know, the supernatural. But I want to say the miraculous follows the presence and the power and the kingdom of God. And, and, and when you, you know, I've been to Uganda and I've seen some pretty unbelievable stuff. 
where Satan is at work, but God is at work even greater. And, and I, I just want to say that there is, there is, there is a, a, a tangible difference when you're in a setting that is, that is full of the kingdom of God, there's the presence of God in a powerful way because people are yielded and people are, are prayed up and people are submitted and people are calling on God. And there's, I'm just telling you, miracles happen today. And Jesus' example right here shows us that when the kingdom of God is present, it works in people's lives, and in situations, and we should be praying for that. This last thing is key, though. At the end of this, and it's kind of almost like verse 23 is like, what, what does that even have to do with this power struggle and the kingdom of God and, and, and God's power being big, bigger than any other power? Jesus says this. This is how he ends his instruction. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And you're like, what does that even, what does that have to do with the kingdom of God? Because Jesus says, when you're seeing this power take place, it's because the kingdom of God is here. Oh, and by the way, whoever does not gather with me scatters. And this leads us to our last point. When we pray, thy kingdom come, we should be praying, God, will you help me build your kingdom? This is not a prayer where I'm like, God, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I sure hope there's going to be other people that do something about this and that, that, that your kingdom is just going to start materializing on this earth. No, no, no. This is Jesus himself says, hey, look, if you are not with me, you're against me. And if you do not gather, you're scattering. So there's, there's a prayer that we need to be praying. God, your kingdom come. Help me gather people to your kingdom. Help me build your kingdom. This is something that's often overlooked by well-meaning Christians who are all in for Jesus, who are so grateful for what God has done for them. And we forget our role in building the kingdom. Do you know that what you've received is so incredible? It's so awesome. It is not only for right here, right now, but it's a, a heavenly future that is so amazing. Look at Matthew 25. Jesus himself says, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Guess what? You, as a follower of Jesus, have been blessed by the Father. You, as a follower of Jesus, get to be those on his right. You have, have the opportunity to enter into this kingdom that says, the kingdom prepared for you. That's good news. Why don't we want other people to experience that same inheritance? We're super excited about our eternal future. We get a little apprehensive when it comes to gathering. A little apprehensive when it comes to telling other people about the inheritance that is possible for them. We get a little uncomfortable about that. But this is such unbelievable news. Revelation eleven, fifteen 15 puts it this way. The seventh angel, actually I'm going to read this because I don't have the whole scripture in my, my notes. The seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And then it goes on to say, and the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God 
fell on their faces and worshiped. God is going to reign forever and ever. I don't know if that's going to be tomorrow. I don't know if it's going to be after I go on. I don't know when that is going to be, but I know this. I get to be a part of that. I get to inherit this kingdom. This is so personal. It says, it has been prepared for you. When we pray, your kingdom come, can we invite God? Will you help me gather? Will you help me build your kingdom? I don't know what that looks like today, God, but I am yielding to you. I may not be a pastor. I may not be a Bible school professor. I, I may not be this or that, but God, will you show me how I can build your kingdom today? Don't rush past your kingdom come. I know we can inadvertently do that, but your kingdom come is one of the most powerful, most intimate, most profound thing that if you earnestly are in dialogue with God about, can transform your life. Thy kingdom come, help me enter today. Thy kingdom come, help me to recognize your power. Thy kingdom come, help me to share the good news with other people that they may be a part of your kingdom as well. In conclusion, I want us to stand. I want to pray for us. And I want us to do something a little different this morning. And that's, Take a moment. I'm going to guide us in a prayer, and I want you to just take a moment that God would begin to practically reveal to you what this looks like, to incorporate this earnestly with sincerity in your daily rhythm. And and. Everybody's going to have their eyes closed and head bowed, hopefully, so no one's going to be looking around. I'm not going to raise, ask you to raise your hand for something. We will have a time of prayer at the end. If you want to come down, I'd be happy to pray for you. But I want you to do something. I want you to do something. You might be like, I don't do that. I, I, eyes are going to be closed. As we pray, I'm going to ask you just to hold your hands like this. This is a act of submission and inviting of God. So let's just close our eyes right now and we're just going to do that. God, we invite you. We invite you to make the reality of your kingdom known. Just pray that right now. God, I I invite you. God, help me enter into your kingdom. God, will you show me what it practically looks like? I've heard your word. I've got some scriptures. But what does it look like this afternoon? God, I pray for everybody in this room right now. I just pray that they would hear from you. God, we thank you that you are Lord. We thank you that all authority lies in you, and we thank you that we can come confidently before you, God. I thank you for that. I thank you that every person here, if they've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they are clean and righteous and pure before you. They may not feel it right now, but I pray that they would understand the reality of the cross that allows us to confidently come into your presence. God, I pray that there be a grace over every heart, a grace over every mind right now. God, help us to move this from concept to reality. 
And we can't do that on our own, so we invite your Holy Spirit and say, will you help us? Will you move? And we'll be careful to give you all the glory and all the honor. And everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Come back next week. We're going to have live worship. Come Wednesday night. We're going to pray together. There's going to be food. And you know what? Find it in your heart to uh, sign up to buy a caramel apple for the Rendons. Amen. God bless you. Come down front if you'd like to pray. We'll see you next week.